digital leader, mentor, founder, investor, random vagabond, mix of that. In the last 20 years, a cult of the new that has risen. You know, these are millions and millions of people around the world who will dig something, buy something simply because it's new, mm. not because it's finished. You know, that's why mm. betas, you know, Silicon Valley players love launching betas. What is betas? It's unfinished product. It's work in progress. What they are telling the world is that, hey, we know that there are millions of you who love anything new <laughs> that is not the world. And uh, you would love to test it, try it, give us feedback. It's an invitation to participate, to collaborate in that journey of innovation. Lovely. Okay. What would you tell your 18-year-old self? Enjoy. <laughs> I think I was very intense when I was 18. <laughs> you know, the girls used to run away because I was so intense. <laughs> you hi tum mujh se baate karti ho Ya koi pyare ka Hello, fellows. Welcome to the next episode of Jagged with Jasravi. Subscribe to my channel for conversations at the edge with thought leaders from the marketing, branding, and the business world. Conversations that ignite new ideas, ideas with rough, sharp edges. Hi, Prashant. So nice to have you on my show. Hi. It is my pleasure, Ravi. Okay. So from now on, you are PK. <laughs> PK, if I requested you to tweet your profile, what would you say? Digital leader, mentor, founder, investor, random vagabond, mix of that. Okay. Okay. So PK... Uh, marketing 4.0, if I say that, you know, what comes mm. to your mind in terms of what is getting shed, what new is emerging? Marketing 4.0 can be defined uh, as uh, how industry 4.0 technologies uh, are transforming the marketing ecosystem. All right. So some of the lead technologies that are uh, relevant to this uh, marketing space uh, are extended reality, whether it's augmented reality, virtual reality, mixed reality experiences, hologram experiences, all these experiences that bring a new level of immersion, participation, optimization, simulation uh, to the marketing uh, space. So extended reality is uh, probably the lowest hanging fruit, but then there is uh, AI. So artificial intelligence, uh, applied intelligence can make a huge difference. Uh, to how marketing is done right now. Uh, and we are already seeing a lot of formative applications of that uh, infiltrating the whole marketing space. And I'm saying formative in terms of uh, putting myself in the shoes of a marketer or the marketing people. Mm -hmm. uh, if you look at uh, the media, for instance, uh, most of the digital platforms are already AI-based, right? The, the content uh, ecosystem, that's very, very AI-mediated already. So uh, once again, People are far ahead of uh, marketing because they're already leading uh, AI curated lives in so many different ways. So yeah, AI is the second big technology that I see making a huge difference to uh, marketing and uh, part of marketing 4.0. The third uh, technology I uh, believe has tremendous uh, value is IoT. And I'm referring spe specifically to B2C IoT. And the way I see it is, Ultimately, if you go to the grain of what uh, a connected object is, a connected thing is, uh, what businesses get to do is exchange, uh, take data from people and in return, deliver value. The value could be in terms of personalization. It could be in terms of uh, some sort of uh, personalized pricing or personalized uh, um, uh, product uh, innovation itself, uh, or it could be other things like personalized promotion, personalized uh, uh, point of sales uh, demonstration. So 
in fact, it, it sort of pervades the entire uh, demand chain. Uh, and uh, I can already uh, see uh, so many different intervention points in the typical marketing value chain. So IoT, I believe, uh, is a huge potential. And that one has really not been looked into a lot, right? Mm -hmm. uh, the fourth uh, technology that I believe will uh, have an impact is blockchain. So already, for instance, uh, uh, supply chain transparency that blockchain is creating uh, is becoming a, a source of brand differentiation in a lot of countries, you know, where sustainable sourcing and so on are becoming very, very important, uh, ethical sourcing. So uh, blockchain, again, holds uh, a lot of potential uh, uh, in this space. Now, I'm not referring to some of the other industry 4.0 technologies like clouds and uh, 3D printing and so on and so forth. Uh, but at some level, they could eventually have uh, some uh, impact as well. So PK, uh, moving enterprises from a current technology ecosystem to a friction-free digital state, this whole digital transformation that is taking place and you uh, with your organization are helping uh, you know, consult organizations, what is the crux about so to start with, I think the whole term digital transformation, I have a huge issue with. I think it is high time we stop talking about digital transformation. Most businesses are not selling digital. What they are selling is customer experience, right? So what the term we should be talking about is customer experience transformation. Right. So, you know, in the 80s and 90s, there was this whole uh, construct of customer value added. And the concept was that uh, everything that a business does, you know, whether it's uh, in the supply side, whether it's in the factories, whether it's in the distribution, whether it's in the marketing, whether it's in the management, whatever a business does in the organization, how internal comms happens, leadership every aspect of a business organization must be weighed on one simple metric, which is, is it adding customer value? Mm. Right? Because it doesn't matter how small or big the activity that a company engages in, if it is not ultimately adding up to the customer value, then the company should not be doing it because that's inefficiency, mm -hmm. right? So I think we live in times where that customer value can be verbalized as customer experience creation. And the experience can be product experience, can be pricing experience, mm -hmm. can be access experience, can be uh, uh, the, the, the brand experience. There are various, or it can be customer service experience. It can be relationship experience, but ultimately everything we do must pass that acid test. Does it deliver better customer experience? And better means could mean different things. It could mean uh, more efficient, more efficacious, depending on the category, it will change, right? Mm. No company is mandated by their board to do digital transformation as if it was a objective in itself, right? Now, the moment you change the uh, goal from uh, digital transformation to customer experience transformation, many things happen. Number one, the investments you make in the process, they all will produce results, right? Because you are looking at whether it adds customer value or not. Number two, then you do not necessarily think in terms of offline or online, right? The world is not online or offline. The world is hybrid, right? Um, increasingly digital first, but overall, I mean, we all lead hybrid lives, right? So, which means that then uh, customer experience uh, creation can be a truly hybrid process. So, these artificial silos between online and offline, which frankly have no business existing in our times, but still exists in more companies. You have on the org charts, you know, you have the digital people and you have the analog people. I, I don't even know what 
non-digital people call themselves these days. You know, maybe they should call themselves dinosaurs or something like that. Point is that these boundaries are artificial, right? So, so that is number two, that we can truly then focus on what matters and that can be a blended, a hybrid uh, experience uh, and it can maximize both opportunities, whether it's uh, offline or online. The third thing is that uh, there are, of course, huge efficiency opportunities that digital technologies have created, right? Because, you know, uh, I mean, uh, the, 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 the replicability mm -hmm. is absolutely uh, at zero cost a lot of times. So uh, the last thing comes in, uh, which is how do you put together a technology and data infrastructure so that that interplay between the physicality and the virtuality can be uh, married in the best way that situated living versus mediated living can be mixed in a very, very seamless and smooth way, right? So, yeah, that would be my take on digital transformation. And that is how we approach clients with that. So, uh, Nippon Paints is uh, the largest uh, paints company in Asia Pacific. But uh, the whole uh, demand chain that they had conceived the customer experience ecosystem that they know was all very analog, right? Because they had uh, won this whole uh, market share game uh, in an era when uh, analog was the way, right? But we could see that they had uh, started stagnating. And, you know, for several years, they struggled to grow beyond that market share. And it was 50% market share. So, of course, there were people who were quite happy with the so much market share, but we felt that there is an opportunity to unlock the next level of value and uh, uh, also uh, put away a potential decline. And that is where we took their entire uh, demand chain and we identified some seven different intervention points where we felt that the customer experience could be elevated to the next level. So and then the right kind of uh, technology and data infrastructure was uh, deployed in order to do that. So for instance, just to give you a little example, uh, of course, I mean, the easy things to do were to build an online shop for them where, you know, people could choose things, they could get uh, designers to sort of uh, apply to their house and see how it looks and stuff like that. Uh, but one uh, very important uh, bottleneck that we felt uh, was very difficult to uh, fix in the physical world was the choice of colors. You see, most uh, uh, normal people in this world actually uh, are not into the engineering side of paint, right? They do not understand the paint, uh, the little nuances of paint quality. But what they do understand is what color should I paint my house in, right? And then, of course, they understand price, for instance, right? So we felt that... Uh, Deciding which color to paint your house in was one of the most difficult decisions. Mm -hmm. And that is why most people end up with very, very generic colors. <laughs> you know, white, slightly creamish, slightly, you know, you can imagine like three, four safe uh, colors, sort of uh, most people just default with because <clears throat> choosing colors is so difficult. Right? Why? Why? Because is, is it like, they can't visualize it. It's, it's, it seems like a risk that it could. It's a couple of things. Hmm. It's a subjective decision. Different people in the family may have different points of view. A uh, young teenage daughter may want to paint in a different color than the wife uh, has her own views about what color should it be. The husband after a while just gives up, uh, you know, <laughs> parents believe that it let it be whatever it is. You know, I mean, there are all sorts of dynamics at play. So that is where we uh, decided to use AI to help uh, people define the color palette of their lives. Wow. So, yeah. So there was a couple of, uh, there was a set of uh, parameters we captured from people and then they are uh, requested to upload uh, in the application, uh, give us access to their Facebook photos. It was still possible in those days. And uh, we look at their highest uh, liked photos and stuff like that. And uh, AI computer vision uh, uses it to develop a color palette of their life. And then they can 
see how it looks into their house uh, through the automated app uh, as well technology does not just make what we used to do more efficient it also allows you to do things that were not possible in awesome. the uh, earlier period right so uh, it was one of the native uh, uh, applications that we developed um, but there were many other features like for instance uh, for the entire b2b side where designers and architects and uh, cxos uh, they uh, pick up colors and they pick up quality and stuff like that there were platforms developed for that the tinting machine how we bridge that data architecture to their uh, uh, demand uh, chain that was uh, designed and uh, it had a, a transformative impact on the efficiency and the impact uh, and the uh, performance of the business wow that's beautiful yeah um, i think you summed it up uh, and that's the that's the potential that uh, marketers and manufacturers should look at what's possible that itself transforms and uh, i mean it's it so that's amazing and when you said the color palette of life uh, yeah. it's so deep i mean <laughs> it's like no in the sense that like our environments also shape us you no know? and then if it's coming from us the colors that are going to surround us i mean it's it's empowering absolutely and you know uh, we are all surrounded by walls right let's say you uh, all the time you spend in the house uh, the the in fact the biggest uh, share of what you see is walls hmm. right so walls are everywhere yet walls are nowhere mm-hmm. because they are a passive backdrop to our lives you know we don't notice them we notice if we put something on them but we don't notice the walls the whole challenge was how do we make them an active participant in the life's moments mm-hmm. all right so a whole uh, moment architecture was designed based on uh, first party data and then we had some third party data and we married it to create a moment architecture and we uh, built a master plan for diversifying the occasions for painting the house because people paint the house when uh, you know there is some renovation going on or it's there been it's been several years since they have done it and we said hey you could mark every uh, exciting occasion in your uh, life by painting a wall from data we moved to bringing more personality mm-hmm. literally more colors into people's lives so in fact the whole uh, transformation was uh, named as paint new happiness so apt so apt amazing you know i mean um, typically you know like it, the moment you get deeper into digital also i mean it's it's actually it's, it's actually very enriching i mean it's not uh, i mean initially it's intimidating but when you see that it's actually facilitating a better life more life it's so human i mean <laughs> the result is very human so uh, like they say you know people uh, talk about social media technology and so on the, the most important uh, social media technology is humans itself uh, so if you see a digital transformation uh, as technology it's complex but if you see it in terms of human experience yep. then suddenly it becomes brutally simple because we all can feel it right so and you know what human experience is what matters technology is purely an enabler right so uh, pk do you want to share a couple of more examples uh, when you've mentored uh, successful startups in southeast asia and uh, how you've built their demand machines because the 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 many many lovely examples so we could quickly yeah yeah on. sure so let us talk about uh, what is uh, one of the more recent unicorns in this part of the world uh, carsum the founder eric uh, so uh, i think first he came to me in 2016 uh, and we were chatting about uh, his business it was still new and uh, it, i think they had been around for 2 years and uh, he told me about the whole idea and stuff and he was in so many ways struggling to break through 
because so carsum is a is an online uh, car marketplace uh, you know for used cars but uh, also for uh, uh, new cars so he was struggling to break through because the habits and norms and malaysia has a very high car penetration rate i mean i think the car penetration is like 70% or something like that so uh, the habits had been deeply entrenched for uh, a few decades already you know you have these massive uh, network of dealers and used car shops and stuff like that and that was the go to place right even though there was tremendous amount of uh, distrust you know i mean used car salesman is an adjective in itself and it doesn't have any decent meaning right so i mean it it's it's uh, it stands for uh, hustle uh, uh, dishonest hustle right so despite that backdrop people were still caught in that habit and he had developed this uh, set of parameters i think there were more than 100 or 200 parameters on which uh, they will take a car they will define the car on those parameters and they will develop a rating and a certification which becomes a currency of a used car's quality right so suddenly with that idea of the currency he put trust back into the mechanism because then everything else is secondary so the moment you put that currency at the center and not the sale at the center then you restore the trust at the epicenter of the business right taking on the largest challenge that the industry faced which is people didn't trust used cars the used car salesman however he was still having challenges and uh, one of the very important insights that we discussed is that ultimately people will move to it not because of the cognitive left brain logic of how this certification can help people know their car better know what they are buying better people will move because it will be seen as the, a lifestyle choice the way to be you know so uh, mobile wallets uh, in so many countries uh, mobile wallets uh, when they started there were very few occasions people could use mobile wallet so you sometimes wonder why do you need a mobile wallet can't you just use your credit card i mean that system had been well set and people were used to it why do you need to use mobile wallets right however the first rush of people who came to the mobile wallets around the world are two kinds of people you have well let's call her trendy tina all right so she is like this young lifestyle uh, fashionista who is hip she is cool she wants to she is always you know very st- stylish she does all the cool things and others like really uh, love her for that and for her that's the in thing you know to use mobile wallets right so she is coming in for it for the hip factor right she is a hipster and then on the other side you have what you can call let's say bargain betty <laughs> because she knows that all the startups did you think of these startups, names right now <laughs> they're so uh, apt <laughs> okay simple okay so uh, you know all these startups fueled by so much venture uh, capital and stuff like that typically give some deep bargains and we look at the e-commerce space everybody started with these massive bargains right yes so they are they are the bargain betties they are thinking very cognitively hmm. uh, but they are looking for hard tangible uh, cost advantage you know what i mean and they tend to be very very disloyal because uh, today this one is giving they will go there they will do comparisons and you know you you can never build your margins basis them or you can't build loyalty with them but they will help you build volumes in the beginning build scale in the beginning right so the two uh, what i call early adopter segments have very different roles and if it's a if it has a relatively sophisticated technology uh, learning curve then you may have uh, say what you could call say tech setters as in people who sort of 
set the trend in new technology adoption you know they, they are the type of people in your friend circle who know a little extra about technology you know you're buying a laptop you ask them which one do you think is the best so they are the people who will go for something that involves a little extra technology so these are the people who come first so we discuss this and then the whole targeting of the business the way they framed their marketing proposition the way they framed their messaging and their media choices and stuff everything was uh, reconceived around this thinking mm. that we have to capture these segments you know mm. so we cannot just think in terms of the functional tangibility we, we also have to think in terms of the lifestyle appeal and how do we make this the done thing you know so and uh, i mean they have uh, had of course an explosive growth and uh, i think now they are in their seventh year and already a unicorn uh, looking to list uh, very very soon so yeah mm-hmm. so uh, i think fashionable tinas are feeling very good and acknowledged <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Well, 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 let us not underestimate their role in the yeah. team. They play Absolutely. a very important role. Absolutely. The loyalty comes from them. Isn't that nice? I mean, typically it would be like, okay, they're, they're flimsy in their choices, but yeah, um, yeah they're and making it cool. Can... They're making it cool and, and uh, aspirational, uh, which is a very, yeah. very human need. Yeah. PK. And uh, Ravi, I mean, uh, my book is uh, about to be launched end of April. Hmm. uh by penguin india and later on in us and uh, southeast asia uh there is uh, one of the trends in this relation that i have spoken about is uh, what i call newism hmm in the last 20 years a cult of the new that has risen you know these are millions and millions of people around the world who will dig something buy something simply because it's new Mm. not because it's finished you know that's why mm. betas you know silicon valley players love launching betas what is betas it's unfinished product it's work in progress what they are telling the world is that hey we know that there are millions of you who love anything new <laughs> that is not the world and uh, you would love to test it try it give us feedback it's an invitation to participate to collaborate in that journey of innovation mm-hmm. right so if you look at the diffusion curve i mean if the, the the classic diffusion curve is a bell curve right it's fully balanced the diffusion curve today is has a significant skew towards the left because of this uh, cult of the new the the the, the newest you know because chasing new has become a uh, matter of uh, self image uh, uh, self expression in itself mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. beautiful <clears throat> that's so lovely it's so refreshing yeah yeah and and it's yeah it's it's a it's it's w- what's the human need there i'm just wondering uh, yeah it's, one is the times there's so much disruption everything is in a flux so newer solutions newer challenges you know that that the new is required and is fulfilling a need but uh why why is this newism why is change becoming a fetish <laughs> right that's I what you love love how you <laughs> phrase it yeah <laughs> <laughs> that and and please uh, share more about your book its premise and any top insights uh i am sure, really sure. waiting for the book <laughs> after listening to you even Thank more so pk yeah many of the things i am speaking about are in the book actually so i am talking from the book in a way uh, because the book is actually a distillation of uh, insights developed as a practitioner mm-hmm. and as a strategist uh, over the years so the two are not different mm-hmm. absolutely and you know when you were saying about um, us wanting to chase the new and adapt because that is growth and uh, that is what has led our human civilization from where we started to here there's also uh, you know i believe there there are these two pulls one you need the familiar 
And one, you need the new to challenge and grow. And that is why when you were talking of the beta, I was wondering that, you know, it's, it's also about familiar with a twist, you know, familiar refreshed, you know, so you, so somewhere it's comforting and somewhere it's challenging and calling you and you go after it. Uh, and, and when you're talking about metaverse, you know, uh, PK, uh, if you, if you want to crystal gaze a little bit more and tell us more about it, because, you know, recently I, I listened to a podcast, uh, uh, of Mark Zuckerberg and I've never heard him speak. I mean, uh, he is a self-proclaimed uh, introvert. Uh, and he was talking about metaverse in the sense that why is online? Oh, and when he talked about it, I got really excited about metaverse. He said, why is online so fatiguing? It's because there is no eye contact, you know. And I felt that what it essentially means is there's no energy exchange. You know, it's just, it's, it drains you. But if you can have an AR uh, existence somewhere, you know, like if, if you were PK here sitting on the sofa with me, you know, your, your identity or your avatar, and, you know, we were talking, it, it would be even more uh, energizing for both of us. A vast portion of people's lives is now what I call mediated living, right? As in we live inside the digital world. Right now, we are doing mediated living, right? Absolutely. What, is the, what formats, what's the form factor of this mediated living? Text, because you're reading text on your WhatsApp all the time. You're reading text on Facebook sometimes and so on. Photos. The most advanced form factor is probably videos. I mean, among the big uh, formats, videos, right? Like this is video. This is the savviest it gets, right? I mean, this... Format didn't exist properly even uh, three years back. It's the pandemic that forced us into this format, right? Yes. But yeah, videos existed, of course. So how old is video? It's a 125-year-old format. In 1890s, when Pierre Coubertin invented the medium of cinema, he invented the format of video, right? Mm -hmm. It's a 125 years old format. You know, if, if, if the car industry worked like that, we would still be using buggies, you know, those horse drawn carts. The digital lives we lead today are deeply inadequate, very, very two dimensional. And what we imagine is as our digital lives are actually not even happening in front of us. It's our brain, which is filling with its imagination. The so even though I've seen a 2d uh, flat uh, video of yours, I'm, I can, I'm trying to imagine depth and, you know, imagine you in a room and it, uh, that meaning I assign to it right now you move to the whole world of 3d spherical immersive experience. That's transformational. That is transformational and it will change everything. Uh, let me give you a little example. Um, take architecture, take interior design, take, um, you know, urban planning. I'm just as an example. All these uh, disciplines are today bound by the physicality of things, right? The world of metaverse will give rise to its own aesthetic vocabulary, its own native design language, which eventually will come back to transform the physical world as well. So we are at the cusp of uh, the next 100 years of experiential transformation. And uh, it is damn exciting. <laughs> I mean, I have spent over the last five years, uh, thousands of hours uh, inside the extended reality formats. Uh, I won't call all of them metaverse. I mean, metaverse as a term is being used very, very loosely. Uh, and I can tell you that it is transformational. Hmm. How do you define metaverse? 
you know, the, the right definition if or also a simple way to look at it is uh, virtual worlds. Mm. You know what I mean? Uh, yeah. Where people have their avatars and they can do things. Yeah. I, it means it could range from uh, games based metaverses, like for instance, uh, for Roblox, to uh, socializing and uh, living based uh, metaverses like Fortnite, to uh, you know, then you can buy properties and stuff like that, like Decentraland, uh, with additional angles, like you could design your own game and all like Roblox. So I'm saying there are uh, various interpretations of these uh, today. The most successful businesses that already exist in that world are actually around gaming. Hmm. So if you look at real revenues, uh, pretty much all of it in percentage terms comes from gaming itself. Ah. Oh, that seems to have come from inspired from some uh, metaverse. (laughs) (laughs) I know. Cool. Mother's best advice. Um, Focus. Okay. Quick beat quicker. Okay. I was kind this time. Yeah. Alternate profession could have been architect. Hmm. What would you do on Mars for fun? Uh, design uh, Mars cities on Mars. <laughs> yeah. As per, as per <laughs> nice. <laughs> as per your wife Tulika, your most often used phrase. Oh God! <laughs> oh, that was the response. Oh God! <laughs> Nice. <laughs> <laughs> Super. No, that's not right, man. But go on. I take I take back my sh- shooting. <laughs> one thing no one knows about you. Uh well, I'm a secret dreamer. I daydream a lot. I can uh, do a uh, uh, 10k jog. And uh, entire jog, I'm like fantasizing about things, you know, you know, maybe designing cities on Mars. And <laughs> lovely, yeah. lovely. Okay, a book you'd like to gift to all your friends and can't be your own book, huh? Uh, 100 Years of Solitude. Lovely. Okay, what would you tell your 18 year old self? Enjoy. <laughs> I think I was very intense when I was 18. <laughs> you know, the girls used to run away because I was so intense. You, know, you ask me anything, and you know, somebody wants to have fun, and I'll give some such deep and intellectual answer that they're like, oh God. Yeah. <laughs> okay. What's your favorite childhood memory? <laughs> uh, well, the memory with my uncle and aunt. Um, they were almost like grandparents. And we had a big uh, joint family, you know, a lot of aunts used to live with us, a lot of uncles used to live with us, and there were lots of children. And Mm -hmm. we had, I had uh, an amazing childhood. It was a very, very happy childhood. Nice. Okay. What is your greatest joy? Uh, Well, talking to my children and uh, giving them... Arav and Abir. Hmm. Arav and Abir, giving them uh, how the world works, advice. <laughs> uh, yeah, Sometimes I bore them because I get too deep. But uh, I think mostly they appreciate. What is a lesson you took a long time to learn? Sometimes you have to just relax. Yohi tum mujhe se baate karti ho Yohi tum mujhe se baate karti ho Ya koi pyar ka irada hai Adaye dil ki maanita hi nahi Adaye dil ki maanita hi nahi मेरा हमदम ये कितना सादा है यूं ही तुम मुझसे बातें 
धरती हो प्रशांत कुमार एंट्रोपिया यू कैन एड इफ यू मस्ट एड बी मोर स्पेसिफिक E N T R O P I A. That's the company I founded uh, five and a half years back, and then I sold to uh, Accenture. We exited last year, uh, so now uh, I am a part of uh, Accenture, uh, Accenture Interactive, to be particular. Uh, e- email well, you can write to me on H E R E I S P K. Here is P K. P K यहाँ है at yahoo dot com. Yeah. So the book is called Made in Future. Hmm. And it's uh, published by Penguin Random House India, and it is going to be. Uh, it's already up there for pre-orders, but it's going to be in all the bookstores by end of April in India. Uh, and uh, also, it's uh, it will be online. I think uh, the the last end of April as well in Amazon. and uh, many other places and audience please feel free to go and pre-order in fact this is the first show i am talking about the book publicly incidentally so yeah yeah uh, <laughs> <laughs> jacket with just ravi is honored yes <laughs> uh right balance between informality and uh, substance uh i think uh, the anchor creates a conversation you know because uh, as uh, talkers we seek our energy from the anchor and we seek that chemistry and we seek that the the the, uh, the type of personality uh, the conversation must have right so towards that uh, i think this talk is not uh, with me it is together us right so thank you for that uh, you make this special please like <laughs> please share please subscribe all right Move forward <laughs> thank you so much pk it's been amazing having you on the show and thank you so thank much you for your much. time <laughs>